Hello and most welcome to 975. This is a test lecture, so to speak. I uh, had the privilege of having uh, to celebrate a 50th birthday yesterday, so I'm a bit out of my way. But my idea was to still have a lecture and see where we end up. It would be quite interesting. And uh, I already prepared before that takes planning. And <clears throat> the name of the lecture is same, same, but different. This is a very common expression if you go to Greece or your people who went to Yugoslavia in the 18th and the 19th uh, decades. They always said when you bought something, electronically or clothwise and it was supposed to be Nike or Adidas or something like that. They all said same, same but different. And this is so fitting in this lecture because uh, the main objective of logocentrism is to find sameness and that has to do with the mirror image. Okay. Move it here. Rodolphe Gachet showed that uh, most of the Western take is about looking for the original, the presence, what is behind the mirror image. And that that thing is the true original, what is uh, first, what is not a copy, what is reality, and also, maybe most important, what is the original, number four, that is. This is this unending quest for presence, which is often called logocentrism. Or metaphysics of presence. It's the urge, this is <clears throat> the urge trying to go back or find once more that presence that is lost and it's a strive to regain what you don't have. <clears throat> In uh, the words of Heidegger, is the amnesia in uh, Derrida. He doesn't really have a term for it, but he, he calls it logocentrism, which is rather vague intentionally. One could also say this is the one for knowledge. Identity, recognition, recognition, you look into the mirror, you recognize yourself. What do you recognize? You don't recognize the thing you see. What you recognize is like an illusion, what you think you see. Mirror image, how the mirror can give you this idea. Want for permanence, because the very moment you get engulfed in the mirror image, you are going to lack permanence because there's a delay there somewhere. If you look into the mirror, you see, oh, there is the reflection. I want to have the original. There is bound to be a time delay, a lag. And this lag makes for lack of presence. The permanence. Therefore, logocentrism or the metaphysics of presence. You want to regain what you lost. And this is one of the reasons it's so important to understand that uh, deconstruction is never ever about criticism. It is about finding out what you really want. You want presence. You want permanence, you want identity, you want sameness. 
the way you go about in western thinking will, will not ever ever lead you to identity presence and sameness never and that's the point of rudolf cache and his book the tain of the mirror he shows that there is a quest there is a, an urge you want to go in a certain direction but as long as you keep going in that direction you will uh, diminish the possibility of finding the correct way you will not find it that way because what you need is actually this is really odd you need to read understand to write you need to read you need to learn how to read that reading has to be careful it cannot be sloppy lazy and you have to put your own energy into the reading. And this is something I mentioned before, that the whole Western take on knowledge is passive. The idea is that you can gain knowledge by not doing anything, hardly anything. Remember the dialogue with Socrates, the whole idea is laziness, more or less. And I think Socrates said, it doesn't take any effort to learn is already out there it's in the outer world <clears throat> what does Derrida say about his project when asked well he never answers directly but if he's being pressed I can see some YouTube clip and also interviews on the internet if he's being pressed he says that deconstruction is careful reading nothing special it's not an ideology, it's not a certain philosophy, it is to read, understand and to write and do that in a fashion that is careful, don't miss the point, because there is nothing to deconstruction, it's not a special ideology, it's not a philosophy, it is careful reading. It's being observant of what's happening. That's why deconstruction without fail almost ever is different from each book that uh, they are produced. It's never ever the same. It's always different. Because it depends on the book, how you read, how you understand. And what Derrida is doing is carefully read. And uh, of course, as you can understand, this makes uh, the claim from the fellows in uh, the institution in Cambridge even more ridiculous. Because they didn't want Derrida because he was actually reading what they were writing. The care for reading was exactly the thing they objected to because it felt weird for them odd it meant going back to the great works of <clears throat> the, the, the great masters and read them really careful without missing one single globe this is what deconstruction is it is about very careful reading and understanding and the objection was against understanding that's what that was what they felt the threat in going back to the canonical reading of Shakespeare or whomever the Bible <clears throat> this is what Derrida does he reads careful <clears throat> So, 
on a first take, logocentrism seemed to be a sort of criticism of sameness. But if you look even more careful, you will find out it is not a criticism of sameness. It is the lack of sameness. Because you do not, because of how your uh, attitude is, how your own reader self is, you don't read careful enough. You have the sloppiness already established. Because sloppiness is what logocentrism is about. Nothing else. It's not an ideology. Uh, Derrida never ever spoke about logocentrism or the metaphysics of present as being a uh, like an ideology. It is sloppiness. And by sloppiness, you think two things are equal when they are not. So, identity, recognition, mirror image, want for permanence, con uh, continuance, sameness, identity. These are the main factors of logocentrism. And the reason for logocentrism, logocentrism wanting these things is because there is a lack. It wants these things because it doesn't have it. So in the actual movement or the motion trying to establish these things, it sort of makes the thing even more permanent, worse. There is an original lack that you cannot negotiate your way out. It is there. And therefore, uh, I think it's very understandable now you understand that deconstruction is not criticism. Never, ever. Could never, ever be a criticism of anything. It is a revealing of the original urge. And it is a just urge. There's nothing wrong with it. The problem lies in how you define sameness. And one of the sides in this sloppiness is taking away the subject, which we, we think is taking away me as a reader, me as an observer in quantum mechanics is actually it is me who uh, make it possible for the superposition to collapse into one thing. Uh, and admittedly, this is how it sounds on the first take when you read Deconstruction or you read Derrida. But if you go down deeper, this is not the thing actually. It's the first hint. Where are you going to go? Well. This is going to be a criticism of sameness. This is more or less what Eva says. But then you realize when you go further and further in, you don't read carefully enough and you learn once more or for the first time in your life, most usually, how to read. You put your eyes to each letter and you don't skip one word. This is careful reading. And in the careful reading, you will discover logocentrism because that is always present in all writing in the Western Hemisphere. And you start to understand the want for identity, for recognition, for the look out of the mirror image, for the original what is not a copy and you get obsessed by this and it is a just obsession it's nothing wrong with it because it's completely natural we all need the original why is that because in the original you can find truth value and justification for what you say so it is the whole Striving for presence is absolutely okay. It is 100% natural. But the problem is before it already happened, the lack was original. 
It has always already been there. It is in the ontic take. It's out there already at the start, and that is the problem. Well, if there is a problem, that is the problem. So what he, his second mission, uh, aside of finding out logocentrism, uh, finding out this want which I shared for many years, identity, recognition, mirror image, want for permanence, continuance, you want to be a continual human being, you want that your existence doesn't uh, cease every moment like it's the case in logocentrism, you want identity, you want yourself to be identical from moment to moment which we know we don't have in Western society, no one anymore. We are <laughs> like goldfish. Our existence starts and you and you and you and you. It is not permanent. And this is one of the reasons so few people today think, uh, even if they believe in a soul, uh, they had uh, modern milligram experiments. Milligram is uh, the psychologist who in the early 60s conducted experiments uh, to see if people were wanting to do the most horrendous things if they were a little uh, encouraged. These experiments has continued because they are now seen to be valid research projects. They get money, they get funding and all that. And even to these days uh, and uh, what these findings show is that it's got even more to the uh, bad side, so to speak. Today, 98% or 99% will actually do the chore, uh, the demand from the beginning. Whereas in the 60s, it was 58%. Now it's almost 100%. And the difference he saw uh, between uh, people of, uh, of the cloth, the rope, relig religious people, it's no longer present as it used to be. Today, everyone do the whole thing, so to speak. There's no difference anymore. Uh, uh, I read a research thing from uh, 2012 yesterday and there is no longer a recognizable difference between uh, anyone in society. It doesn't matter if you are the low class, middle class or high class, uh, whether you uh, are very educated, not so educated, it is all the same today. It used to be a big difference in the 60s, still it was a big difference. In the 60s, 90 or 80 percent in the United States who were men of the clergy refused to push the button uh, at the very last of the experiment. So there is a change going on. And I think, uh, I read the change only in uh, uh, Spengler from the 20s. Uh, my friend David, he really pointed it out. There was a change in the 20s and there was also recognition. And there are also more writings from that period. But somehow I forgot it and I got into this uh, emotional idea that uh, knowledge was still possible. So I had both views. And when people heard uh, Spengler, they all said, that's pessimistic, that is bad talk. This is, this is not accurate, this is not correct. But uh, from a Deridian perspective, from this lecture's perspective, it is correct in some ways. It is same, same, but different. The looking for sameness is absolutely correct. It is something you need. Derrida recognize this. This is a just want. You want sameness. You want to have something that is permanent, you want true meaning. But what he says is maybe the way you're looking for it in that area, you won't find it. This is more true to the actual case. 
He does not say, as Jordan Peterson thinks, there is no possibility for truth. No, what Derrida is saying, there is no possibility for truth in the area you are looking. There is still a possibility. And um, this is things that Derrida himself would never ever have said. He said, rather look for yourself. Try to find out yourself. Uh, so I should maybe not say it today, but I'm still saying it. Uh, I think the whole mission uh, of Derrida is to look for truth. It is to look for sameness. It is to look out for what is constructing the world. All the things that he said I am not guilty of looking for permanence. I'm not guilty of looking for an ontology of being. I'm not out there to find Usia. In some ways, it is actually true. It's very odd. But the thing is, the looking for the mirror image as Rodolf Cachet, it's an honest mistake. It could happen to anyone. It has happened. It did happen, it can be corrected, but it's, it is an honest mistake. Nobody meant to delude all of humanity. And it does happen in a real circumstance. It happens when you look into the mirror. It is the mirror that caused the whole thing. It seems odd, yes, but this is what happened. What Derrida wants us to do is to read once more because the ability to read has been lost. We no longer read anything. We are not careful in our reading. What we do is skip lines and we try to preemptively reinterpret the text. And this is also the reason why logocentrism is not an ideology. It's not a particular way of reading anything. It is trying to show us how to carefully, letter by letter, go through the text and reach proper understanding. Not a preemptive idea, and this is also the reason he used polarities. It had nothing to do with polarities as such. Polarities, binary oppositions, is not the specific thing. It is just sloppy reading. You always do binary opposition when you don't read anything careful, because binary oppositions are nothing than a very first outtake of what something is about. If you give me a text and I am rushing for the train, I don't have the time to read it properly. Therefore, I am going to have a first idea of what the text is because I only have five minutes. And I read it maybe running like this, and therefore I can't understand it. That is what polarities is. It is nothing special about polarities. It's not a thing in itself. It is not something to get fixed on. It is not uh, a description of what logocentrism is or metaphysics of presence. It is what happens if you don't go into the text. It is what happens today when people read Shakespeare. They don't have the intellectual capacity to understand it. That's what it's about. It's not about a specific fault. It is not something that is similar. But it usually takes the forms of binary opposition. So you see the problem here in understanding Dara, which was a problem for me for so many years, it was, I thought, that Derrida was describing a certain tendency, uh, a sort of a striving within Western thinking and ideology where 
it actually was sloppy reading in the, in the beginning. Laziness and intellectual laziness. We mentioned that before, passivity. The idea of thinking that perception could in some weird way be absolutely passive. You can sit down and just perceive this uh, strawberry. And I somehow it's supposed I could eat it and I could enjoy it without being present. That's not the case. Mm. It's most delicious. What deconstruction means is do engage in the text. Do read it carefully like it was meant to. Even though in some cases not even the writer was aware of this. Not even the writer had the full capacity to read his own text. Yes, I know this goes against the intuition, but this is what Derrida says. And I agree with him, absolutely. Could be the case, when you sit down and write something, you excel your own ego, your own understanding. It's always the case, I would say. Every time you sit down and write something or do something, construct something, you excel your own ego. But just the case that you're not aware of it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It still happened. And so now you see why both the writer and the reader are sort of being sloppy. The writer is being sloppy about his own achievement, naturally. Because we never, ever, in any case, in any moment, in any second in our lives, do we know how much we know? Never. Never happens. We never know how much we can achieve. It's not a possibility to know that because our achievements excels that little reflection that we call ourselves. Always. And uh, this is why they call Derrida the person who brings out the text. He brings out what the author intended. It's never about criticism. Uh, you can see in YouTube clips when people are asking him in the 70s and the 80s, what sort of criticism is deconstruction? And he always gets so angry and says, it is not a, deconstru it's not a criticism. Deconstruction is taking out the original text and showing it for the reader and the author. Both. You never ever, and I think this is so evident that it needs to be repeated, you never ever know what you have achieved. Because your doings always have to be bigger than your consciousness of it. This is completely natural. And uh, I'm sorry to say, uh, I didn't realize this until I started to study neuro neurology. It, I didn't understand it. I simply could not understand it. I thought it was an impossibility to achieve more than your consciousness understood because in the idea of the Western uh, logocentric tradition we have this idea that you are aware and your awareness is what can bring out a masterpiece or any sort of piece. I don't do masterpiece but I do some, I do some maybe some writing. And somewhere in this way, uh, by studying neurology, I understood, my God, we always achieve more than we can think of because consciousness is not about that thing. Consciousness or reflection, the mirror image. When I look into the mirror, it is not to understand my thinking capacities. It, it has other reasons. Those reasons could be various. Uh, very hard for me to give an example in this moment. It could be to fix my hair, um, see maybe um, some food products or something left. But it's not about identity. I don't have to look into the mirror to know who I am. And by doing that, if I do that on a regular basis, this is 
very original. I'm happy that we made the lecture today this early. Uh, this is a new understanding from my point of view as well. But understanding is not about sameness in this crude way. It is specific sameness. It is exact sameness. Because if you look into the mirror, you do that hastily. You don't put any intention. And that is the problem according to Danny Dahl. If you look carefully, if you want to, you will see it. there is a difference between yesterday. There will always be some difference. Maybe your hairs on your brows have grown a bit larger or some other difference. There is always a difference. And that difference is in itself reality in a way. We understand things from how they are different. Let me give you an example. You don't have to do this in a manner that looks fractal, and uh, maybe I shouldn't. I'm going to do it anyway. Fractals is not about things that look fractal, actually. <laughs> yeah. But if I do a copy of this, it be hard. The outtake, the read-off. What we're looking for when we want to uh, establish permanence, identity and sameness, it's we misunderstood the process, so to speak. We made the ontic move. And in the ontic move, it is the idea this or this, A or B. That is the true original. <clears throat> what is the case in actuality? It is the very contact between something different to something else that is different. And I uh, called this earlier endogenous, exogenous. It could be anything. But no matter what you call it, it is just when you compare one thing to another thing. It's that simple. Then you get to read off. How could you get to read off if you have sameness? Sameness is what you get when you compare two things. It is a process. It's an activity. It is not in the things. It is when you do something. And that is the difference between ontic and ontological. Ontological, according to Hassel uh, and Heidegger, is you ask the why question, you actually do the thing, you do the work. Whereas in the ontic mood, <clears throat> you are being a bit sloppy or lazy. Or you don't even know you're being lazy, which is even worse. And then you think, I choose A or I choose B. It doesn't matter. But you misunderstood the original project. What? Why are you doing this? Because the why question is gone. I can't find the why question anywhere in Western philosophy. It's not there. It is truly forgotten. You only have what. And what cannot answer. <clears throat> what comes out of the read-off, it don't, don't answer. The what question asks, what is this and what is this? It cannot tell you the answer to what is the difference. That takes why, because there is an original cause why you started the whole process. Why did you do it? 
This is not part of the question, oddly enough. It is <coughs> the question what comes in late. It is after the fact. And this also explains why it is so convincing. Because in a way it's completely true. It's not a wrong question to ask. But it is wrong in timing. It's a correct answer. Abs the what question, <coughs> the empty question is not wrong. It is just that it comes too late. It comes after the comparison. That is the problem. It's a problem of timing. So <coughs> this is why uh, Derrida jokingly said, you can get rid of all my books, you don't need them anymore. Once you realize how you read carefully, but he said this in a joking manner. Why? Well, because that is an eternity of learning to read carefully, because it is not <clears throat> zero or one. <clears throat> the text doesn't have an end to it. You can always learn more from the text. It has an immensity. So it is not about correct reading. It's more like a ladder or something going up. So there is no correct reading. And uh, although Jordan Peterson, he would ooh, get really angry and attack Derrida and Foucault even more. But it's a positive thing to say what Derrida said. What he means is you can have more and more understanding. There is no limit to the understanding. There is no ultimate understanding of Otello or uh, Hamlet, for instance. It would be horrible. And if you would have to ask Shakespeare, uh, hello, William Shakespeare, what do you think? Would you say there is an ultimate reading of your works? And then you're finished and you can truly die. You would say, no, this is not what I intended. That's never intended. It is actually to ridicule a masterpiece, to say that there is a final reading of anything. This is horrendous to say that. But this is sloppiness also. This is not looking carefully enough into what really is in the text. What is in our reality? Careful reading is more what deconstruction is about. It is not an ideology, it's not a philosophy. Yes, <clears throat> you can go to Wikipedia, you can read a definition of deconstruction and <clears throat> the works of Derrida. That's okay. <clears throat> but once you start to understand a little more deeply, you understand also why he rejected all definitions of deconstruction and why he always, without any exception, got angry when people said it's a criticism. It's never ever a criticism. Never. Not a single moment. It's something negative. Because that would actually reinforce the ontic question. Because the ontic question is <clears throat> is what presents itself yellow? It's, you, you hear, it is all, already there is something sort of hidden in the question. When I ask <clears throat> what color does this have, <clears throat> I don't, I sort of take away the question, why is it there? Does it serve any purpose? Why was it built? All those why questions disappears in the moment you accept the what question. Or you in yourself formulate the what question. Once it's done, it cannot be undone. You get locked and your answer will reaffirm the original understanding or as I would like to call it experience. Because it comes from reality. This is why what makes Logos Antrims so hard to beat. I know this is not a good example, but uh, I usually mention this anyway. It could give you a hint. I hope it does. 
but this is the question, have you stopped beating your wife? And it doesn't matter if you say no or yes. You are still in the what question. So you will be damned if you do, but you will also be damned if you don't. And that is maybe a helpful hint to what is the ontic mood. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the pedagogy here, but I think so. Could happen. I hope so. <clears throat> I think this is a very good point to round off and say thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Have a very pleasant afternoon. Bye bye.